Today on the Matt Walsh Show, the Minneapolis School District instates a policy of laying off white teachers before black teachers. This is supposed to prevent systemic racism, but uh, how do you prevent a thing from happening by doing that very thing? Also, the Democrats double down on their favorite strategy, emotional blackmail. Tragedy strikes CNN and thus the entire nation. Sam Harris says that sometimes you have to subvert democracy in order to save it. Does that make sense? In our daily cancellation, the new feminist She-Hulk show premieres, and it's about as insufferable as you might expect, all of that and more today on The Matt Walsh Show. When running a business, you'll get hit with all kinds of interesting scenarios like an employee not showing up to work on time, mandatory sexual harassment or workplace safety training, wrongful termination suits, uh, minimum wage requirements, labor regulations, all of that. One complaint can destroy your entire company. The problem is HR managers, though, are expensive. They can easily cost over $80,000 a year. But with Bambi, you get access to your own dedicated HR manager starting at $99 a month. All of Bambi's HR managers are based in the United States and can support the nuances across all 50 states. Your manager is available by phone, email, and real-time chat to help you effortlessly run employee onboarding and terminations, encourage good for performance, and make sure your business stays compliant with ever-changing HR regulations. With Bambi's HR Autopilot, you can automate the most important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. In fact, Bambi clients are four times less likely to have a complaint filed against them. So go to Bambi.com slash Walsh right now for your free HR audit. You can run your business let Bambi run your HR, spelled B-A-M-B-E dot com slash Walsh, Bambi dot com slash Walsh. Early this morning, the Twitter account for the LAPD posted footage of what they describe as a flash mob of looters ransacking a 7-Eleven uh, in the city. The, looter, the looters swarming like piranhas or vultures, take your animal of choice there, can be seen stealing candy and bags of chips and cigarettes and other necessary items before they begin ripping the place apart, just sort of for the fun of it, it would seem. Now, it may come as a shock to um, AOC, but the one item left untouched in the store is, is the bread. The bread aisle is untouched. I didn't see anyone take any loaves of bread. None of the looters appear to be starving. In fact, um, many of them seem to be very much uh, on the opposite end of the starving spectrum, let's just say. The other thing you don't see in the footage, of course, is any sign of law enforcement. Now, one might point out that the LAPD would be better off showing up to the scene of the crime and carting the criminals away in handcuffs rather than simply tweeting about it after the fact. We, we have long had a problem in our society with people filming crimes rather than trying to actually stop them. And now even the police have adopted this strategy. Now, of course, from the perspective of the police, they know that the Soros D DA uh, will, will just release anyone they arrest. They also know that if they have to get a little rough with any, with any of the precious innocent children ransacking the convenience store, they'll end up in prison on hate crime charges. You know, if they show up there to make some arrests and uh, it turns out that some of the people there don't want to be arrested and so they resist and then the police, God forbid, have to use physical force to detain the suspects, then it becomes, well, then, it's, then it's, a, it's a hate crime. So what are they going to do? Instead, they just post the video. But then the video doesn't matter because the Soros DA won't pursue or, or prosecute any of these people. They could all be wearing name badges with their addresses and phone numbers on it, and it wouldn't make a difference. They're not going to be held accountable, and worst of all, they know it. That's the recipe for anarchy. And this is the anarchy that has obviously gripped hold of our cities all across the country. But there are a few other ingredients necessary to create a scene like the one in that footage or in so many similar incidents that we've witnessed, especially in recent years. Another essential ingredient, obviously, is the collapse of the nuclear family. You know, if there were 100 people pillaging that 7-Eleven, I don't know how many people it was, let's say it was 100 I'd be surprised if even one out of 100 lived in a house with both a mom and a dad present. It's a general rule that kids with dads at home don't loot convenience stores. Now, there may be occasional exceptions to that. There's a reason why communities with much higher rates of intact families have much lower rates of mass looting and other forms of criminality. In fact, um, I don't know. We'd have to take a look, but has there, 
Has there been, has there ever been mass looting in a community with, um, you know, a fatherless rate below like 50%? If you can get, if you can even get over the 50% mark with kids at home with mom and dad, is, are there any examples of mass looting in a community like that? Another ingredient, though, not unrelated to the others, is entitlement. You know, the looters feel not only safe and secure in their actions with the knowledge that they'll not be held accountable, but also importantly, and this is the part that maybe we don't talk about enough, they feel morally entitled to behave as they're behaving. Indeed, they've been explicitly told by activists, by the media, by powerful voices in Congress like AOC, that they have every right to steal and destroy as they see fit. The, the narrative of systemic racism has allowed people like this to delude themselves into believing that they're oppressed by society and thus society owes them something. Namely, society owes them whatever they feel like taking at any given moment. They're victims. And as victims, they're not responsible for their actions. They can do what they want. The, the leftist racial narrative allows them to believe that systemic racism is the biggest problem in their lives and in their communities, even as they actively work to destroy their lives and their own communities. The narrative self-perpetuates in this way. Like, you know, we're often told about food deserts in urban neighborhoods. That actually is one of the justifications also given for looting. It's a food desert. It's the middle of a city, but it's a desert. There's nowhere to get food. You know, we're told that there's a lack of grocery stores and convenience stores and other amenities. Well, and, and then we're told that this is due to systemic racism. And yet, the stores that do exist in these neighborhoods are targeted and victimized by the members of the neighborhood. The community violently chases businesses away and then claims that the void is caused by racism. This is the sort of destructive incoherence brought about by the systemic racism narrative. Speaking of which, the systemic racism lie has uh, given rise to another even more egregious injustice this week. And this is a story that hasn't um, gotten nearly enough attention. So I'm going to bring it to your attention now if you haven't heard about it yet. The Daily Wire has the story. Reading, quote, it says, a Minneapolis teachers union is stipulating that white teachers uh, be laid off or reassigned before educators of color, quote unquote, allegedly to remedy the continuing effects of past discrimination by the district. Minneapolis public schools have seen a massive drop off in student enrollment, leading to layoffs of teachers with little seniority, something that is typical within the teaching profession. But the Minneapolis Federation of Teachers is opting for racial standards before seniority to guarantee educators of color protections, according to Alpha News, which reported this on Sunday. Starting with the spring 2023 budget tie-out cycle, if accessing a teacher who is a member of a population underrepresented among licensed teachers in the site, the district shall access the, the, nec the next least senior teacher who is not a member of an underrepresented population, according to the agreement. Accessing refers to the reduction of staff. Teachers of color may be exempted from district-wide layoffs outside of seniority order, the agreement says, adding that the reinstatement of teachers from underrepresented populations will be prioritized over white teachers, according to Alpha News. The racial stipulation was added in part in the name of social justice or to remedy the continuing effects of past discrimination by the district. Past discrimination by the district disproportionately impacted the hiring of underrepresented teachers in the district as compared to the relevant labor market and the community and resulted in a lack of diversity of teachers, the agreement reads. Now, as you might imagine, this policy of firing the white teachers first, which is what it explicitly says. Well, it doesn't explicitly say that. What it explicitly says is we're going to fire the or lay off or excess uh, members of, of, of the overrepresented groups instead of underrepresented, which, of course, means white. Now, this is being criticized, not the least because it's blatantly illegal. I mean, at least... Technically, in theory, racial discrimination in hiring and firing is illegal. But just like the laws against looting are not enforced, neither are the laws against racial discrimination. And the pushback and, and also the explicit illegality of the plan have not swayed the school district at all, which defended its racist practices in a statement a few days later. 
Uh, the New York Post reports, quote, the school district released a statement to the Washington Times on Tuesday offering a full-throated defense of the groundbreaking deal with the Minneapolis Federation of Teachers, led by President Greta Callahan. The statement says, to remedy the continuing effects of past discrimination, Minneapolis Public Schools and Minneapolis Federation of Teachers mutually agreed to contract language that aims to support the recruitment and retention of teachers from underrepresented groups as compared to the labor market and to the community served by the school district. So basically, they're just restating what, they, what, the, what the agreement says. In order to heal the wounds of racial discrimination, they will engage in racial discrimination. This is like, I don't know, trying to heal the effects of rat poison by giving the victim more rat poison. Or you know what? That's not actually the right analogy. That's wrong. It's more absurd than that. Because this is healing the effects of rat poison by forcing some other guy to take rat poison too. Okay? Someone's been dosed with rat poison, and then the doctor shows up and says, I know what we're going to do about this, and then just grabs some other guy and shoves some rat poison down his throat. See? There you go. Now, now two people are, are poisoned. Now, that's what you do when you're not interested in healing. Instead, you're interested in vengeance. No matter if the person you're getting your revenge on had anything to do with the alleged crime that was supposedly committed. But this is the point of the systemic racism narrative. It is to seed resentment, hatred, a lust for vengeance, and as we see among the looters, an unearned sense of entitlement as well. That's the whole idea. And it's having the desired effect. Now let's get to our five headlines. Regardless of what the administration defines as a recession, Americans are nonetheless worried. Food and gas and prices are uh, higher than I've ever seen in my lifetime, which is why I'm so grateful for my favorite meat delivery service, Good Ranchers. While grocery store meat prices continue to rise, Good Ranchers has your back. Their inflation-proof model locks in your price the day you subscribe for the life of your subscription. Plus, you can pause your subscription for up to 90 days or cancel anytime you want but you won't want to. I guarantee that. Not only that, but uh, Good Ranchers is also currently running a back-to-school give-back program with the goal of donating 100,000 high-quality meals this month to children in need. All you got to do is go to goodranchers.com slash Walsh. Use code Walsh at checkout. You'll get $30 off plus free shipping. You can subscribe to lock in your price and recession-proof your meals for life. And you can help these guys reach their goal of donating 100,000 meals to children who, who may need it going into the fall semester. That's goodranchers.com slash Walsh. And remember, as always, to use code Walsh at checkout. By the way, a little bit of a exciting personal news and, and update. We did, um, you know, as you know, we have uh, another set of twins on the way. I think I've mentioned that before. And so we were able to find out the gender yesterday. Yes, we, we, are, we are assigning a gender to our, our twins. We're, we're not going to give them, if you could believe it, just like with, with our other four kids, we're not giving them an, a choice in the matter, you know. Um, actually, uh, biology and nature isn't giving them a choice in the matter. So we discovered that uh, the twins are boys, which is, uh, which, which actually came as a shock. You know, my, my wife, up until this point, I thought she had like magical superpowers because she can pre predict the gender of a baby when it's still in utero and not only for our own babies, but other people. And she's, and she's always right until now. And she, so I, she was like batting, batting a thousand on predicting these sorts of things. And then for, for our next set of twins, she said, oh, they're girls for sure. I know that. Turns out not. So the boys are taking over. It's gonna, the girls are going to be wildly outnumbered in my family. And, you know, you always get the question of, uh, well, what, 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 uh, you know, which, which is easier, boys or girls? And I, I don't know. I think it all balances out in the end. But uh, certainly for the first, you know, 10 to 12 years of life, I think boys present probably more of a challenge. And mainly the challenge is just like keeping them alive, keeping them from destroying themselves and everything else in the house. So that's the challenge that awaits us, which I will take on eagerly. All right. Um, I want to start with something that was put together by a group called the American Firebrand Pack. And I don't know anything about this organization, but they compiled this montage, which they posted on social media. 
And I think it's pretty powerful in that it reveals the Democrat strategy of emotional blackmail. And this, as we know, is a strategy that has gone into overdrive this week in particular with all of the charges of spastic scholastic terrorism or whatever it's called, um, incitement to violence, right? Where I'm being accused of that, libs of TikTok's being accused of it, conservatives in general being accused of, uh, we're going to kill people. People are going to die because we're merely pointing out what these children's hospitals and quote unquote gender clinics are doing to kids. By pointing out the reality of what's happening to kids, we, we are going to end up killing people. And if you feel like you've heard that before, that line from, from the left, well, if you do this, if you say this, people will die. If you feel like you've heard it before, it's because you have, as this uh, montage of the Democrats' moral blackmail strategy clearly shows. Watch this. People are dying. People will die. Women are going to die, Gail. Women will die. If you are also not going to allow trans kids to play sports, children will die. We've seen that trans kids suffer from extremely high suicide rates. But to hear a 10-year-old say that they would rather die than experience male puberty. The most comprehensive study to date on climate change predicts more and more people are going to die from air pollution if changes are not made. People are suffering and dying. People are dying. These policies kill. People will die. People die. How many more people have to die to get some gun control? Your mistake is killing the children in your state. This decision and this policy will kill people. We are also going to see a lot of South Dakota women die because of this. It's not an extreme statement to say that women will die. I thought I was going to die. People are dying because of misinformation. How many more Americans have to die? People are dying and will die who don't have to die. This is a death cult. Let's get on with the dying. People will die. You know, and, and actually, everything you heard there, I mean, the basic underlying claim is, is, is actually true. And uh, I am sorry to have to be the one to always break the news about this, but it is true that, you know, people will die. Everyone will die. That is the, uh, the consequence of being mortal human beings. Now, are they going to die because of opinions that you've expressed? Um, are they going to die because of, because of realities that you have pointed out? Well, obviously not. And you know, the, the irony of, the, of this method from the Democrats going around all the time saying, people will die, people will die. We, can, we can't do this because people are going to die. Is it? First of all, from their perspective, since, since when is that even a bad thing? They don't care if people die. They hate people. Now, as much as we just heard from Beto there calling conservative, conservatism or, or Republicans uh, you know, it's, it's, it's accusing us of being in a death cult. Oh, really? We're in a death cult? W which side is it? Again, just remind me, that has overseen the systematic slaughter of 60 million human beings in this country? Remind me again which one that is. Remind me again which side it is that, that actually will say that, there's a, that there are too many people on earth and we need fewer of them. Which side is it that talks about human beings like they're a cancer, a disease on the earth? I mean, which side is actually openly conspiring to... Um, to limit the number of people who exist. Remind me again. So where's the death cult? No, in order for the people will die thing to, to mean anything, you know, in order for that to motivate people, you, you have to actually cherish and value human life. You have to see human life as inherently uh, valuable in some way. And on the left, they, they don't. And that's not a, a straw man or me making a caricature of their position. They really don't. Now, they might not come out and say it very often, but if you press them on it, they will admit it. But does human life have inherent value? Their answer is obviously no. And 
Because if you believe that it had inherent value to begin with, you couldn't support the slaughter of 60 million human beings in the womb. But also, in order to see that human life has inherent value, then you, know, you have to believe that there's, some, uh, that there's some greater force, some greater power out there beyond just ourselves and our egos. But if we're all just clumps of tissue walking around and life has no inherent meaning, then it doesn't even matter if people die. It doesn't matter if they live. So that's, that's, that's how the left looks at it. And yet they still use the people will die line to try to manipulate us. Well, hopefully, you know, anyone listening to this, I, I don't need to tell you that you shouldn't fall for that. especially when they're using it to try to prevent you from, from speaking the truth. All right. I, I'm, I'm sorry we have to talk about this because, uh, especially on a Friday, you know, I, try to, I try to keep it a little bit lighter if I can. Probably could have fooled you on that one. But it is a time of great sadness in America. Um, it is a period of mourning and lamentation. It began about a week ago when, uh, and I don't even know if we ever talked about this, and I, I feel qu- quite ashamed, actually, that I think we may have, I, I may have inadvertently ignored it. So it was, we, we got it back up to about a week ago when the news was announced that uh, prominent masturbator Jeffrey Tubin was leaving CNN after 20 years. Now, Tubin, famous, of course, for pulling his tube out, says the decision was mutual to leave CNN, um, others are saying that it was about as mutual as his decision to fondle himself in the presence of his colleagues on a Zoom call, which is to say that in both cases, the decision was actually made by one party while the other party recoiled in horror, horror and, and was traumatized. Whatever the case, I don't know. All we know now is that Jeffrey Tubin is unemployed and many fear will be left with too much time on his hands. And who knows what else? on his hands. The good news is he no longer has to, you know, put on his pants and go to work. Not that he ever saw the former as a necessary prerequisite for the latter. And I don't say any of this, by the way, um, to make a joke about the esteemed Jeffrey Tubin or his unfortunate masturbatory adventures. Um, I would never joke about that. You know, frankly, it's, it's kind of low hanging fruit. Instead, I say all this as, as a tribute. Um, to the man who gave so much of himself to his job. Some would say a bit too much of himself, actually. Either way, may he rest in peace with both hands above the waist. But Tubin's demise is not the only tragedy to befall CNN. So that's what happened last week. Um, Not the only tragedy to happen uh, to CNN, and by extension to the entire country, or at least most of our airport terminals. It was announced this week that the man affectionately known as Mr. Potato Head, I think it's affectionate, Brian Stelter is leaving CNN. This was the news yesterday. First we lost Tubin, now we're losing Stelter. CNN reports, CNN's reliable sources with Brian Stelter is coming to an end. The company announced Thursday that it's ending the media analysis show that has aired in various iterations for 30 years. Its last episode will be this Sunday. As a result, Brian Stelter will leave the company, a CNN spokesperson told CNN Business. Oh, so they're, they're pretending that they're not firing him. It's just that the show's going away. You know, of course, Brian Stelter says, well, I could do another show. Oh, no, that's all right. That's okay. We, you know, we'll let you, you go do, you know. Well, that's, it's better if you, if you just go and work for someone else. Uh, they say, we appreciate his contributions to the network and wish him well as he embarks on new endeavors. Now, and then Brian Stelter said, uh, well, who cares what he says? You know, it, 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 was a, it, was, it was an interesting choice, first of all. I was kind of interested by the fact that they chose to announce the end of Brian Stelter's show like this. Because, and I'll tell you why it's interesting, because if they hadn't said anything at all, nobody would have ever known. Like, they could have ended the show and not told us, and we would not have known. Stelter is like the guy in Office Space who, uh, who was the guy in Office Space who was fired from his job but remained on the staff for like five years and nobody ever realized Milton. Brian Stelter is Milton. He's the Milton of cable news. Something similar could have happened here. Like they could have just 
ended the show, and then 30 years from now, thrown Brian Stelter a big retirement party and, and congratulated him on three decades of service to the company. And nobody would, no one would be the wiser. Anyway, now Stelter is unemployed also, looking for new opportunities. And I'm hopeful, honestly, and I, and I know that I've criticized him over the years, um, and uh, I've criticized him for, you know, just being a, a being a propagandist and a pawn who, you know, his his show was supposed to be a sort of like a media criticism show. That's the way it was positioned as sort of the ombudsman type role where he's he's criticizing the media and, and keeping a watch on the media. But all he ever actually did was defend the media against legitimate criticisms. And so I've criticized him for that. But the truth is that I, I am hopeful that he finds a new job that's um, I'm hopeful he finds a job that gives him an even bigger audience. Maybe, for example, he could deliver the morning announcements at his local middle school. Um, that'd be kind of a step up. I don't know. And the truth, obviously, is for Brian Stelter that he had that the real problem is that uh, once Trump went away, he had nothing left to talk about. And there are many cases like this. This is this is the the crisis that the media has faced for a few years now. That their entire brand and personality centered around Trump, and then Trump left, and um, they've had years to figure something else out, and they just haven't been able to do it. Which is why, I mean, never believe anything anything otherwise. They they desperately desperately want Trump to run again, and they want him back in the White House. Anyway, so that's the sad news. Brian Stelter and Jeffrey Tubin. All right, I want to play this clip. This is something that was making the rounds yesterday. Uh, Sam Harris was on um, the Trigonometry podcast, which, by the way, I appeared on that podcast as well a few uh, days ago, and you can go to their YouTube channel and watch that episode. And after you do that, um, or, or I guess you, you can do that after you watch this clip, this is uh, Sam Harris, also on the same podcast, who, you know, was a, to put it mildly, is, is a Trump critic, doesn't like Trump. And he was asked about some of the dirty tricks that were pulled, especially when it comes to the Hunter Biden laptop story that ended up you know, resulting in, in Biden getting elected as the media and big tech conspired to suppress these stories. Uh, does he have any ethical qualms about that? And, and Sam Harris says no. Let's listen to the clip. I mean, Hunter Biden, at that point, Hunter Biden literally could have had... had the corpses of children in his basement, I would not have cared, right? It's like, it's, there's nothing. First of all, it's Hunter Biden, right? It's not, it's like, it's not Joe Biden, but even if Joe, like even the, whatever scope of Joe Biden's corruption is, like if, you, if we could just go down that rabbit hole endlessly and, and understand that he's getting kickbacks from Hunter Biden's deals in Ukraine or wherever else, right? Or China, it is infinitesimal compared to the corruption we know Trump is involved in. It's like, it's like, it's like a firefly to the sun, right? I mean, like, there's just, it doesn't, even, it doesn't even stack up against Trump University, right? Trump University as a story is worse than anything that could be in, in Hunter Biden's laptop, in my view, right? Now that's not, that doesn't answer the people who say it's still completely unfair to not have looked at the laptop in a timely way and to have shut down the, you know, the New York Post's Twitter account. Like that, that's a, just a conspiracy, that's a left-wing conspiracy to deny the presidency to Pause Donald it there Trump. for one second. Um, and usually Sam Harris is a pretty clear, I don't, I don't agree with, with much of what he says, but he's usually seems to me to be a pretty clear thinker and not on this. You know, because there, 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 there's a, a, a lot of, contradiction happening here, starting with the fact that, that he says, um, well, Trump is worse because his crimes are worse, allegedly, right? He, he claims. He's done a lot worse things. And so that's why we have to do whatever we can to keep him out of office. But then he also says, I wouldn't care what, what Joe Biden did. So Trump is worse because he's done worse things. But even if Biden did worse things, which by the way, you know, killing children and having them in the basement. I understand that this was meant to be hyperbole, but he's 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 making the point, whether with hyperbole or not, that literally no matter what he did, it 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 uh, he still would have preferred 
Biden over Trump. So, I mean, do you think that Trump is actually literally the worst person? Like, no one could have ever, ever be worse than, than Donald Trump? I guess that's what you believe. So, on one hand, he's, he's basing his assessment on, you know, what, what he believes Trump has done versus what Biden has done, what they're both guilty of doing. But then on the other hand, he says it doesn't really matter what they do. So, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Also, the other thing that he's missing completely here is that how do we know about corruption from elected officials and powerful people, especially presidents? I mean, how do, how do we know if they're corrupt or not? Do they announce it? Are we relying on them to come out and, and just tell us, yeah, I'm, uh, here, here's, here are my examples of corruption, everybody. Here it is. No, no, no. We, we need people to tell us. And that's traditionally what you need the news media for. Because the average person is not in a position to investigate the corruption of a powerful elected official. So we need someone to do it and tell us. So are you not curious about that? I mean, are, are you not wondering that, okay, like whatever Trump has done, we, we know all of it because there is the media is obsessed with finding everything. He's got, he's got the entire federal government coming after him. So there are no secrets here. All of Trump's sins have been laid to bear because there are a lot of very powerful forces that are extremely interested in finding out what those things are and telling us. But Sam, are you not, have, are you not seeing the issue here? that for Democrat presidents, there aren't any powerful forces even interested in finding out what the corruption might be. So when you say that Trump is more corrupt than Biden, what is that even based on? Now, by the way, it's, it's, it's also not true. Like even, even, even looking at the corruption we know about from Biden, it is worse than Trump, hands down, far and away. But my point is that like the corruption we know about, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, an important qualifier there. Because the things we know about are only the things that slip through the cracks. All right, let's play the rest of the clip. Trump, absolutely it was, absolutely, right? But I think it was warranted, right? And, I'm, and again, it's a coin toss as to whether or not Sam, I'm sorry. that particular piece I'm, I'm really yeah. sorry. I, I was the one that said we should move yeah, on, yeah. but you've just oh, said yeah. something I really struggle with it. there, which is... The, you kid, the, support. Kid, the, kid, the kids in the basement? You, no, no. <laughs> the kids in the basement. I'm interested yeah. in democracy. You're saying you are content with a left-wing conspiracy to prevent somebody being democratically re-elected as president. Well, no, I'm, I'm content. Well, so it's, but the thing is, it's just not left-wing, right? So Liz Cheney is not left-wing. Right. Liz Cheney is You're doing everything with a in her power. You're content conspiracy to prevent somebody no, being democratically it's not a, No, but there's nothing, conspiracy, it's not, it, it was a conspiracy out in the open, it does, but it doesn't matter if it was, a, it doesn't matter what part's conspiracy, what part's out in the open. I mean, I think it's like, if people get together and talk, and talk about what should we do with, about this phenomenon, you know, if, if it's like, if there, if there was an asteroid hurtling toward Earth and, and we got in a room together with all of our friends and had a conversation about what we could do to deflect its course, right? Is that a conspiracy? Hmm. Uh, so Trump was a, an asteroid set to destroy life on Earth. You know, it, 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 more incoherence here because Trump is allegedly a threat to democracy and that's what makes him so dangerous. And that's why we have to do everything we can to stop him, but yet you're subverting the democratic process to stop him because you think he's a threat to the democratic process. So you're destroying the democratic process to save the democratic process. I think we've heard that kind of thing, but it reminds me of, a, who is it, George Bush? So we have to abandon the free markets to save the free markets, I believe was his famous quote, infamous quote. But this is also ends justify the means, which is what you get on the left. It's like, you could do whatever you want um, as long as you get the result you want. All that matters is the result, and anything done in service to that result is automatically okay because of the result. 
So that's what he's, that is what he is actually struggling to defend here is the ends justify the means mentality. And the reason he's struggling to defend it is because it is a morally incoherent um, philosophy. All right. Speaking of uh, moral incoherence, so here's a study from Axios. And it is, I haven't even looked at these results yet, but I just saw this pop up and I'm reading it now. So this is, uh, they are examining the differences between public and private opinions. And they say self-silencing, people saying what they think others want to hear rather than what they truly feel, is skewing our understanding of how Americans really feel about abortion, COVID-19 precautions, what children are taught in school, and other hot button issues, according to a new study. The best predictor of private behavior is private opinion. People's actual views are far more likely than their stated views to drive consumer and social behavior and voting. So um, this is analyzing public versus private opinion in, in individuals, which already I'm not sure how you measure that exactly. Because whatever they're, you have, to, you have to ask them, right? And so whatever they're telling you is, I guess, their public opinion because they're saying it out loud. The private opinion is what they believe in their heads, but there's no way to measure that really because the moment they say it out loud, then it's no longer the private opinion. So I'm seeing some problems here already, but let's go, let's go ahead. Uh, it says, by the numbers, on abortion, the study found that men are much less likely to privately agree with the idea that the choice to have an abortion should be left solely to a woman and her doctor than would say so publicly, 45% to 60%. Wait, okay, the study, men are less likely to agree with the idea that the choice to have an abortion should be left to a woman and her doctor. Uh, Republicans, meanwhile, were less likely to privately say Roe v. Wade should be overturned than publicly. On education, Americans overall are privately more supportive of, pa of parents having more influence over curriculum than proclaim this publicly, 60% to 52%. Americans are less concerned about teachers talking about gender identity or how much public schools focus on racism than they say publicly. Only about half of Americans actually think it's inappropriate for schools to discuss gender identity in kindergarten through third grade compared to the 63% who say so publicly. Okay, right. Um, all right, sorry I wasted your time with this absolute nonsense study. Right, so people are more conservative publicly, is what you're trying to tell us, on issues of gender identity than they are privately? Yeah. Obviously, the exact opposite is the case. So what they want us to believe is that there are a whole bunch of Americans running around saying that they don't want to teach kindergartners about gender identity. They say that publicly, but privately, they really want it to happen. <laughs> right. Um, that's not even close to true. It, it actually makes no sense whatsoever. Because there's no, the, the, the self-regulation happens the other way. People present themselves as more liberal in public than they actually are in private. That's how the self-regulation works. And how do I know that? Well, very simply, because that's where all of the social incentive is. There's no social incentive to, to pretend to be more conservative than you actually are. Zero. And also, the, the, the punishment goes against the conservative view. Because all of our most powerful institutions demand that we have liberal viewpoints on these subjects, especially on subjects like gender. Media, academia, the government, everywhere, Hollywood, big tech. So all of the social pressure falls on, on trying to, to make people, uh, you know, be more liberal on these subjects. And yet we're supposed to believe, based on this study, that, uh, that somehow people, pe people actually intentionally put themselves in line for social ostracization and punishment by pretending to be more, by, by adopting more unpopular views, at least unpopular in the minds of our elites. It makes no sense whatsoever. But thanks for doing the study anyway. All right, one other thing I want to mention here 
Interesting story. Um, it says, a pastor in Missouri rained down a fiery sermon upon his flock one Sunday this month, scolding parishioners for failing to follow God. Uh, the Reverend Carlton Funderburk condemned his congregation not because they'd sinned too much or loved God too little or done too few good deeds out in the world. Instead, Funderburk rebuked the cheap sons and daughters of the Church of the, of the Well in Kansas City for not honoring him by buying him a luxury watch. Now, I, I'll play this clip for you. And I watched this clip and I, and I, you know, I immediately thought, okay, you always have to keep in mind context. And when you see a clip and it's 30 seconds or 50 seconds, you got the other. What happened before and after that? Is there some kind of context here that would make this sound you know, not as horrible as it sounds? Well, apparently not, because this this pastor has since apologized for this clip exi- that you're about to watch right now. Um, here it is. Let's listen. See, that's how I know you're still poor, broke, busted, and disgusted because of how you've been honoring me. I'm not worth your McDonald's money. Come on. I'm not worth your Red Lobster money. I ain't worth your St. John Nick. Y'all can't afford it, no how. I ain't worth y'all Louis Vuitton. I ain't worth your Prada. I'm not worth your Gucci. Mother, oh, I'm saying this, and I promise you, Deacon, it is not with respect of won't. I'm saying it because I want you to understand just what God is saying. I even found out that Movado, you can buy a Movado watch in Sam's. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. And y'all know I asked for one last year. Here it is the whole way in August. I still ain't got it. Y'all ain't saying nothing. Let me kick down the door and talk to my cheap sons and daughters. <laughs> now, uh, this is obviously widely inappropriate and actually insane. This is, uh, this is, that's like prosperity gospel on, on steroids, really. I mean, this is, and it, it, prosperity gospel, unfortunately, is uh, very, very popular. Um, and, and it, even if the, if the advocates of it rarely will, will, you know, identify themselves as such. But prosperity gospel is the idea that uh, you deserve to be blessed with, with, uh, with, with actual riches, like physical riches, um, if you're a, a holy person, that 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 God will 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 reward you with physical wealth and riches in this world, and that you deserve it. Now, of course, that's pretty much diametrically opposed to what Christ actually says in the Gospels. So, which is why it's not the actual gospel; it's the prosperity gospel. That's kind of what we're hearing here. Um, much more direct than what you're used to hearing. That said, you, you also see what a what a what a advantage it is to have a powerful preacher voice and cadence, because you could get up there complaining that you're that you weren't given a watch, and people in the congregation are saying, "Amen, that's right." It's the power of a, of being a, a good public speaker. You can, you can see what you can see the advantages there. Let's get to the comment section. Some states now have laws that say as early as the 2030 model year, new vehicles will have to be electric in order to be registered. Cars with internal combustion engines will only be able to get license plates if they were built before the end of the 2020s, which means that people are going to be keep, going to keep repairing and driving their old cars for generations. It also means you'd better go to rockauto.com right now and order all the parts to properly maintain and repair your car your great grandkids might be driving that car someday, so you gotta take care of it. RockAuto.com has been in the auto parts business for 20 years. Family owned, their goal is to make auto parts available and affordable to keep you safe on the road for as long as possible. RockAuto.com's online parts catalog is incredibly easy to use. You can search all the parts available for your specific car, SUV, or truck with photo specs and installation tips as well. Not only will they um, have the part you need, but they'll usually give you several trusted brands to choose from also. RockAuto.com's kits are popular because they bundle together all the parts you need for successful repair. you got everything you need right in one place. All you got to do is go to RockAuto.com, get brake shocks, carpets, wipers, headlights, mirrors, everything you need at RockAuto.com. Be sure to write Walsh in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know that I sent you. Before we get to the comments here, I wanted to um, 
if I could get serious yet again, and I'm sorry I have to keep on doing this, but um, I have been talking about on this show for the past couple of weeks, you know, while other shows have focused on less important issues, I have been talking quite a bit about um, the issue related to my giant stuffed walrus, which, as you know, <clears throat> was apparently purchased for me as a gift by this company and yet never given to me. Uh, no explanation has ever been offered for why my giant stuffed walrus was, was why I was uh, deprived of it and still am deprived of it. And, you know, as we've been talking about this, and I, and I, and, and I can tell you that here at work, I've been, I've been investigating. I can't get anyone else to take the investigation seriously. It's like everyone else here, they're just whistling past the graveyard every day all wrapped up in whatever they're doing. And no one is taking seriously the fact that there's a giant stuffed walrus somewhere out there that I have not been given, even though it's mine. So in my investigation, I stumbled ac across this. And I, I have to tell you, I was stunned when I saw this. This is a video. This is true. This is a video from Ben Shapiro's Instagram account, which was posted back in June. And it's been sitting there. No one ever told me about it. I just want you to see this video. Watch. I think Walsh took this a little bit too far. Get your, get your hands off my walrus, Ben, first of all. That's not yours. That's mine. So you see, okay, number one, you can see the giants. I told you it's giants. That's the stuffed walrus. So now I'm just trying to figure out what's going on here. That I was not given the stuffed walrus, but you, but we, you were using it for, for an Instagram video for Ben? Does Ben have it? Okay, I, I don't know. We're, we're going down the rabbit hole here, and, uh, and, I, and I'm starting to get, frankly, disturbed by what I'm finding. But I will not relent. All right. Alexandra de Berdeja says, uh, Matt Walsh's mouth. Welcome to the members only segment. My personal favorite part of the show, Matt Walsh's brain. I can't believe DW has me doing this stupid stuff. I want to go home. That's not true. I'm, I'm very excited about doing the members only segment, which we, know, which we have added to the end of the show. Uh, because I, everyone knows that you know I love nothing more than talking to begin with, and um, and I've I am always saying how at the end of the show after talking for an hour uh, I want nothing more than to continue talking some more. I, like I'm always saying that, and and so you know being given the opportunity I, is very exciting for me. That's that's sincere. Hugh Jarsol says. Is it me or did Matt basically confirm it was Domino's he witnessed this poor behavior at? I realized I may be banned for, for this. Um, I can confirm nor deny what pizza place I worked for. Um, I, I just, you know, I, I will say that at least when I was working in, in that industry, there were all kinds of things, you know, that I witnessed behind the scenes that I mean, most of it having to do with, with food safety and, and sanitation. But uh, it's, it's just, it, it's made me less enthusiastic about eating pizza from those kinds of places, I will say. Uh, Samuel Hayes says, Matt's not wrong about the pizza thing. My pal worked for a CC's that swept ingredients up, rinsed them, and made a pizza with the floor toppings. Meanwhile, I worked for a local pizza place where the cooks sniffed cocaine off of the same counters that they chopped ingredients on. So you get a little bit of cocaine on the pizza. I don't, I don't know if people will see that as a disincentive or, or not. Um, Bean says, it's not illegal to yell fire in a crowded theater. Why are we still at this LMAO? Yeah, the fire in a crowded theater thing has been used. Uh, that was it's been used against me this week. It's, it's incitement by talking about Boston Children's Hospital. And we know that the, the fire in a crowded theater thing is a, it's a, it's a stupid cliche. Uh, but, but even more so, you know, one of the reasons why it's especially absurd in this case is that we could, we could talk about the scenarios and the, the legality of crying fire in a crowded theater when there's no fire. 
But certainly, if there actually is a fire, then we could all agree that not, on, not only is it okay to yell fire, but um, if you saw a fire in a theater and didn't tell anybody and maybe just snuck out the door yourself and left everyone to die in the inferno, then, uh, then at the very least, that's immoral, if not uh, illegal. So that's what makes the charge so especially absurd. Because when we talk about the fact that Boston Children's Hospital or any of these other children's hospitals or, or clinics are castrating and sterilizing kids, and we're yelling fire in that sense, it, well, there actually is a fire. It is really happening. And so what the left is saying is, um, no, even if the theater is on fire and everyone's going to die, don't tell anyone. Keep your mouth shut. Let, that, let them enjoy the, you know, the last few minutes of the film before they all burn to death. That's what, that's what the left is saying. Um, and finally, Mike says, Matt, on the tipping conversation, if we paid people a living wage, then it wouldn't be necessary to tip. Well, first of all, it depends. I mean, you know, we, we use this term living wage like it's supposed to have some kind of objective meaning. What, what, do you, what do you mean by living wage? If you mean by living wage, a wage that someone could live off of on their own and support themselves indefinitely, um, well, not every job was meant for that purpose, right? Like not, not every job is, is meant to be a career for an adult to have and, and, and keep for years on end. And so, for example, you know, working a McDonald's drive through is, is not meant to be a, a career where you're supporting yourself and a family off of it. It's, it's, these are really jobs meant for like kids and high school students and you know, people working part time for some extra money. Um, and as far as the tipping part, it just we, we did talk about this in the member segment yesterday, and uh, and I think I've talked about it before on this show. But all I'm I'm not anti-tipping. I'm, I've actually always been a believer in tipping, and I think I'm a pretty good tipper. But we just need to. We're always being told we need to have national conversations about this and that subject. This is a subject where we actually need a national conversation, and we need to talk about what what r- jobs actually deserve and warrant a tip, and which don't. Because right now it is just totally out of control. Uh, and it's, it's, we can mainly blame it on the stupid little iPad things that people use now if, instead of cash registers because they just flip it around and say, oh, would you like to leave a tip? And it's like, no, I, I don't, not necessarily, no. You hand me a cup of coffee. Why do I want to leave a tip for that? You were running a cash register. I, I ran a cash register when I was a kid. I never asked for a tip for it. This is an important conversation we should have. Well, the story of my plight has been heard far and wide as I have whined about it incessantly. As you're all aware, the giant walrus that was created and planned as a gift for me is still hidden somewhere within these walls. How can you hide a giant walrus? Well, I don't know. The outcry of support, in addition to the condemnation of those guilty of withholding the gentle semi-aquatic beast, is, uh, is welcome, and it's also uplifting. And yet, the hope I've drawn for my sweet babies pales in comparison to the devastation of this agonizing, forceful separation. It is literal violence. Some might even say stochastic terrorism against me. That's why this month's patch is the hashtag give Matt his walrus patch. Uh, They've made a patch. The the very people responsible for the abomination plaguing me while I was ravaged by laryngitis are monetizing my suffering. But in this case, I'm okay with it. So go to dailywire.com slash shop to get the latest installment of the Matt Walsh patch program. I can't believe they're making me do this. I feel like a hostage reading my own captor's demands. Can they do this? Why are they doing this? They actually took the time to write this out. These questions I'm asking, I'm writing right now. Uh, my, my, own, my own existential crisis, I'm reading from a teleprompter at this moment. I'm still reading copy right now. This is not stopping. This is cruel. Almost as cruel as not being given my walrus. So go buy the patch. Also, last week was a week like no other. I triumphed over my illness and was able to release the 1,000th episode of The Matt Walsh Show. 1,000 episodes is a massive milestone in my career, but that's not, that's only just the beginning. If, uh, if you want to see one of the most important things I've ever done in my, my lifetime, 
you have to check out my documentary, What is a Woman? It has more than 5,000 audience ratings on Rotten Tomatoes. even has five brave critics who were willing to review it, and they all gave it a thumbs up. Just uh, in the month after we released What is a Woman? The Daily Wire gained more members than at any other time in our history. It just goes to show that uh, if you make something worth watching, unlike most Hollywood films, people will watch it in droves. So if you haven't seen it yet, go to whatiswoman.com and uh, watch it right now. That's whatiswoman.com today. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. So earlier in the month, it was announced that Warner Brothers would be shelving their new Batgirl film after having already spent $90 million to produce it. The move was devastating for Batgirl's fan But it made sense from a financial perspective. The studio realized that the film would be a massive, embarrassing flop and decided that they'd rather just take the tax write-off than cut their losses. Now, of course, if they'd asked me, I could have told them before they even made the movie that a movie called Batgirl would be terrible. I mean, replacing Batman with a 97-pound female, it's like remaking Jaws, except with with a dolphin. And on second thought, that analogy probably makes Batgirl seem more interesting than it really is. Although we'll never know for sure, as the studio executives have taken the Batgirl film and thrown it into a volcano, ensuring that nobody ever sees it and it never falls into the wrong hands. But the untimely demise of Batgirl has created a void now. The public is clamoring for a new feminist superhero to step in and carry the mantle. Well, really, nobody is clamoring for a feminist superhero. Literally, nobody on Earth. That's the whole reason why Batgirl ended up in the volcano to begin with. Be that as it may, Hollywood is ready to, del- ready to deliver what nobody actually asked for or wanted. And this week, Marvel's new series, She-Hulk, debuted on Disney+. Plus. Even before the show premiered, the cast had already started using the Batgirl tragedy as a means of morally blackmailing both the studio and the public into supporting their project. A headline on Yahoo News reads, After Batgirl cancellation... She-Hulk cast and creators stress the importance of studios supporting female-led superhero projects. Translation, you all better pretend to actually like this book we produced or you're all sexist. The message is made clear in the article. It says, Marvel boss Kevin Feige was among the first to reach out to Batgirl directors Adil L. Arby and Belil Falah, who also worked on Miss Marvel, to express his support after the cancellation news. Likewise, the team behind She-Hulk shared their sympathy. Quote, it is so hard to imagine the disappointment that those filmmakers must be feeling because these projects take years, says She-Hulk director and executive producer Kat Coro. I've been working on this for years, and the idea of it never seeing the light of day is, well, it must be crushing. She-Hulk has long been regarded as one of the most powerful feminist icons found in the pages of comic books, making the arrival of attorney at law all the more impactful at this particular moment in time. Coro says, It's exciting because just her very existence is a feminist. She's large. She's in charge. She controls her own narrative. The MCU has, for a very long time, been very male-heavy. There hasn't been a lot of female representation. So it's nice to finally start making some progress in that area. Now, I do agree that large is quite often an apt description of feminist. I'm not sure about the rest of it, though. In any case, the blackmail worked, and She-Hulk, despite being just as humiliatingly terrible as Batgirl would have been, was allowed to debut and uh, be seen by literally dozens of people. One particular clip from the show's premiere has been uh, making the rounds online, though, helped by the IMDb Twitter account, which tweeted the video with the caption, ahem, say it louder for the people in the back. The clip shows She-Hulk lecturing regular Hulk about how difficult her life is. Because, of course, the whole reason audiences flock to superhero shows is to hear their favorite superheroes complain and feel sorry for themselves. Here's the clip. Here's the thing, Bruce. I'm great at controlling my anger. Mm. I do it all the time. When I'm catcalled in the street, when incompetent men explain my own area of expertise to me, I do it pretty much every day because if I don't, I will get called emotional or difficult or might just literally get murdered. So I'm an expert at controlling my anger because I do it infinitely more than you. As we can see, self-pity is She-Hulk's superpower. Her high-pitched whining is enough to make any supervillain flee out of just sheer annoyance. Of course, the experiences she describes in that monologue, which was apparently curated from a Twitter thread written by a Jezebel blogger, are all, at worst, mild annoyances. 
I mean, if those experiences are the worst hardships in your life, then you have led an exceedingly privileged existence. And trying to explain why her life is so much harder than Bruce's, She-Hulk can only mention the trauma of receiving unwanted compliments and of having her credentials questioned. And she then says that uh, she can't complain about these experiences because if she does, she'll be insulted or murdered. The interesting thing about this claim is that it's, it's not only delusional and insane, but also self-negating. She clearly has no problem complaining and is quite eager to do so. And far from being killed for it, she's instead hailed as a hero. This is a common theme with the feminists. They, they claim that they're not able to talk about their troubles when, in fact, that's the only thing they ever talk about. And anytime one of them does talk about it, the others say, yeah, finally someone said it. What do you mean, finally someone said it? This is all, we've heard this a billion times. But simply exaggerating your own sufferings is one thing. You know, we can all tend to fall into that trap sometimes. The real problem with She-Hulk's approach here and with the approach of feminists in general is the assumption that no man could ever suffer or does ever suffer like women suffer. She-Hulk declares her struggles to be infinitely more numerous and severe than Bruce's or any other man's. Now, we could maybe ignore the claim if it was just coming from a character called She-Hulk, but the problem is that this is the attitude that our society seeks to foster in girls. That's why they put it in the monologue to begin with. In truth, there is nothing to be gained by comparing two groups against each other and trying to determine who has a harder time of it. But if that is the game we're playing, most of the statistical evidence would seem to suggest that in modern America, Women generally have the better deal. That's why girls are more likely to graduate high school, less likely to be suspended or expelled. Women are less likely to commit suicide, to become drug addicts, to become hopeless, to homeless, to, uh, to less likely to suffer from workplace injuries. Women are less likely to be the victims of violent crime. They're less likely to be blown to pieces on the battlefield. But sure, I guess the homeless, drug-addicted, suicidal, war-injured veteran on the street probably doesn't get catcalled very often. So man, he's got nothing on She-Hulk. Now, nobody is suggesting that women have no challenges or obstacles to overcome, but the idea that they have more obstacles than men or more serious ones is just not borne out by the facts. I'm sorry. And besides, as already noted, the comparisons are absurd and pointless. The only thing worse than being self-pitying is to be competitive in your self-pity. It's bad enough to walk around dwelling on your misfortunes. It's even worse to insist that you win the prize for the most misfortunate person in the world. And it's especially ridiculous to make this claim when you are a young, attractive woman in the modern Western world. Because our modern society is essentially tailor-made to facilitate the happiness and success of that category of people. This has probably been a more serious analysis of a She-Hulk monologue than was necessary, but someone has to mansplain these things to her, and I was more than happy to step up to the plate. And someone must especially say to She-Hulk that you, ma'am, are canceled. And that'll do it for us for this portion of the show as we move on to the post-show or we move on to the next segment, rather. And if you're not following us over there, then Godspeed. The Matt Wall Show is produced by Sean Hampton, executive producer Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover, production manager Pavel Vodowski, our associate producer is McKenna Waters. The show is edited by Jeff Tomlin. Our audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is done by Cherokee Hart. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2022.